Shea. I'm the head of adult programming here at Darien Library. Thanks so much for coming out tonight in this lovely weather we're having. Uh, some people asked if the program was still going on, and luckily we've had this presentation scheduled the entire time, so that of course is going on. And then afterward we can evaluate and see if we want to go use the telescopes outside. That part will be optional. This part is required, just kidding. Uh, you can't use the telescopes unless yes. you sit through it all. <laughs> I just wanted to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign, so thank you so much for your continued support to make exciting programs like these available to the community. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Attila El Teto, the Professor of Astronomy at University of Connecticut. And where was and the, school? And Novatek Valley Community College. Yes. And he's an actual astronomer, which is pretty cool. So, go ahead. All right. Hi. Hi. So, uh, I'm Dr. Tello, but considering you are not my students currently, I will allow informality and let call me a Tello. <laughs> a little bit about myself. First of all, for those of you who uh, want to get the elephant out of the room, it's a Hungarian accent. I'm a Hungarian-American. Uh, I was born, born in Hungary, arrived in the US in 1993. Uh, for eighth grade, terrible year to uh, arrive at. Um, then, uh, at that time, I actually lived in Stanford and then went on to study astronomy at Cornell. Then, earned my doctorate in planetary astronomy at the University of Colorado. Um, lovely place, a very well funded school. Um, and, uh, in case you want to know about my thesis project at the time. Uh, it was about analyzing infrared observations of uh, atmospheric dust in global Martian dust storms. <laughs> okay, Martian dust storms, to make, uh, make it short. That's what I was studying at the time. Um, I will be happy to tell you more about myself at a later time, but I actually want to generalize a little bit more about that because in today's program, uh, what I'm planning to do is not tell you about astronomy, but being an astronomer. Uh, maybe I'm understanding that some of you have never even looked through a telescope. Some of you might have, some of you have more background than others. And at the end of, uh, by the end of uh, the talk, I hope I will give you a little bit of taste on how you can do astronomy yourself and why you should do astronomy. So, let's see. So what is astronomy? Astronomy, when most people think about it, is, well, I've seen all those pictures that they show on CNN, on NASA TV, and whatnot, uh, the pillars of creation, uh, the rings of Saturn, all of that. We think about all the pictures, and especially we are, okay, um, we get a lot of boost from Hollywood, who completely misrepresents our science, but we don't mind because it's great publicity. <laughs> but that's what most people and students entering my classes also think that, oh, this is going to be a slideshow for, for the entire class. Um, no, actually, there's a lot more to astronomy and, and, that, and that. So, yeah, there's the fantastic pictures. This one is a very active star that is like half exploding, but not really. Uh, then you always hear there's great numbers about astronomy. Oh, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across. What the end is a light year? <laughs> Most people can't, can't imagine it. Uh, Jupiter is 140,000 kilometers across. OK, I can't conceive that because I haven't even been around the Earth once. Um, so uh, over here for this uh, star, it's 100 times the mass of the sun. Sounds awesome. OK, but it's, in itself, it's a meaningless number, actually. And of course, the fascinating story is uh, that this supermassive star may explode as a supernova. Sounds exciting. So yeah, most people think about astrometry because that's how it's presented to them. So what are all the things that astronomy deals with? Uh, oh, and by the way, I, uh, this is a disclaimer that I will come back, uh, back to that, yeah, 
astronomy has all of this, but how do you know it's really astronomy and not somebody just making up stories? After all, uh, in uh, in uh, the movie Avatar, they had the what unobtainium or something. That was a great story too. <laughs> so, astronomy in 500 words or more, <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> Well, it deals with everything. I, I just told people that, yeah, when I teach one, that's one of one, one uh, I tell them, all right, so I'm supposed to tell you about everything that exists in the universe in 15 weeks. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but astronomy is not just about the large, it starts small. Uh, uh, shooting star, which is uh, actually uh, just a little uh, bit of space debris, no more, uh, most of them no bigger than a pebble. It's very, it starts very small. And in some ways, I, I, astronomy actually goes even deeper because it connects with nuclear physics. Uh, there are slightly larger things, like the satellites of planets, a few miles across. The planets themselves, we know how big our planet is, although, as I said, most people, because they, throughout most of their lifetimes, don't even get out of the state, uh, don't actually get uh, uh, at an idea about the size of our planet. There are bigger planets than our own. As I said, Jupiter, the biggest uh, planet, is about 12 times the diameter of the Earth. The Earth itself would fit across the face of the greater spot twice. Then there is the Sun, uh, uh, even bigger. The sun is not alone in the universe, lots of stars that are light years apart, which is far, far, far beyond the scale of the solar system. Uh, the stars organize into galaxies that, uh, as I said, uh, over here you wouldn't be able to point out a star like the sun. Uh, the galaxies uh, are organized into uh, ga galaxy clusters. And then beyond that is, well, the entire universe itself is being a representation of the universe in terms of the cosmic microwave background. All right, so that's too much altogether. <laughs> and I'm not, definitely not going to cover that within uh, one hour. As I said, what I really want to talk about is the aspect you cannot, you usually cannot look at yourself and there aren't that many shows about because you usually hear the shows about the actual astronomy stuff. But where did it uh, get discovered? Astronomers. <laughs> I can gaze at the stars and get paid for it. How amazing is that? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's my point. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, who are astronomers? When you think about an astronomer, what's in your mind? I'm throwing that question out there. Please raise your hand. Yes. Uh, a researcher and a scientist. A researcher and a scientist. OK. What do you mean? Let's have a couple of more. A partner in the middle of the night in the cold. In the middle of the night in cold. Yes, yes. Any other? Someone who is patient. Someone who is patient. Interesting. The character is as big. Yes, it's a patient. People think it's about cold, night, yes. Futuristic. Sorry? Futuristic. Futuristic. Astronomers are futuristic. Hmm, anybody else? They look for light by outside the Earth. They look for light outside the Earth. Very good. Well, most people then you know, picturing an astronomer, they think about people in the white surgical lab coats looking through some kind of telescope at an observatory late at night when it's cold, uh, and looking at pictures coming in, like over here, which I saw all from Asteris, uh, it's black and it's like a ball, right? it's, it's a black ball. That's what people think about astronomers. That those aren't the only astronomers. Everybody is an astronomer. You just don't think about it. 
you don't necessarily think about this astronomy actively, but everybody is an astronomer. Everybody looks for lives beyond the Earth all the time. Especially starting with the most obvious, during the day light. Of course, you should not di ever directly look at it, but the sun is beyond the Earth, and it's light coming from beyond the Earth. Everybody is an astronomer. Now, let me show you the world's first astronomer. I have an actual picture. <laughs> That's the world's first astronomer. From the very beginning, once again, yes, we have looked at lives beyond, and it affected our lives profoundly, looking at day-night cycles, uh, looking at uh, seasons, how those affect us. But of course, we have gone far beyond that. We have uh, astronomers don't look that weird anymore. <laughs> this, is, uh, this was actually one of my professors back at, at Cornell. But yeah, not as, well, uh, he doesn't uh, use the stone tools. I think that's the difference. And he's got the glasses. So, you, you don't need a telescope to do astronomy. This is all you really need to start looking for astronomy. As I said, cavemen didn't have <coughs> those telescopes. The sun, day night cycles, it's about astronomy. Looking at the moon, which we would be doing if it would clear up. Looking at the stars themselves, or even planets. You can see uh, some of the planets, naked eye, and you hear every few years that, oh, there's this alignment, and then there's immediately the panic that, oh my god, the world is going to be destroyed by the alignment of the planets. Don't worry, it won't. But all of this you can do without even Having even heard, having heard of telescopes, you don't need that. But of course, once you get a little bit more into it, it and ever since the 16th century, uh, these are available. Um, you can start using uh, optical aid, uh, even something as simple as a binocular. Uh, how many of you have binoculars? How many of you, of you who have binoculars have used it to get stars? Ah, but half of you. The rest of you, check it out. You <laughs> can make Exactly. Uh, you, and I will talk about this later, how much more you can get out of the sky, how amazing it becomes with something as simple as a binocular. You don't need the uh, Cat telescope in Hawaii to get some amazing images. Even with these small as telescopes, you can already see a lot more than what I just showed you. For the moon, you can start seeing the craters. For the planets, uh, for Saturn, you will start uh, seeing the rings, Jupiter, the bands, and you will see things that are invisible to the naked eye, but with a small telescope, you can start seeing them. You start to see the invisible. But of course, people think about astronomers, well, yeah, they think of the futuristic ones. The futuristic ones that use all those huge telescopes and that produce, at a much higher cost, by the way, uh, these images of the same thing that I just showed you before. These are now Saturn rings produced with a uh, space probe that actually went to the planet. This is how Jupiter now looks, and this is how the Orion Nebula now looks. So, the stars. And over here, I'm not going to talk about the physical object stars, I'm talking about uh, the actors in this great movie called Astronomy. The actual astronomers, most people think about astronomers as just the people who look through telescopes and then make interpretations. There's a lot of other kinds of astronomers as well that people take for granted. In general, you can think about them this way. They are the instrumentalists. They usually act. They are at the center of the actual action. They are the ones who create all of those kinds of instruments that, that tell us 
about the Martian soil, the Martian dust storms. Uh, yes, as I said, that's, that's what my PhD students, that's why I'm treating that as, as an example. They are the ones who put together either the Hubble Space Telescope for you, and then the thriller part is the fact that uh, if a space probe oh, tries to land on a planet, there is that terrifying wait time of us not knowing whether it survived or crashed. That's why I'm calling them not just the action, but the thriller people. The observationalists, they are the classical ones, the one everyone think of, <coughs> thinks about when they are thinking about an astronomer. They are the ones who actually use telescopes, but observational alias don't, are not restricted to ground telescopes. Obviously, the Hubble Space Telescope itself, or this in space, it's not as if astronomers should go out there and try to look through it. Uh, that would be kind of expensive, is it? Or all of those space probes that went to the outer planets. That's observation analysis doesn't mean ground telescope. And there are the theorists. Yes, I had a few less pounds at that time on me, who try to interpret all of the data that the observationalists uh, create for us uh, using the instruments from the instrumentalists. It's a whole big, nice hierarchy of family. Uh, and usually, most of, the, uh, most of the attention in the news goes to uh, the observationalists, in, because they are the classical ones, and they are the ones who uh, discover the extrasolar planets and whatnot. Most, uh, a lot of the Nobel Prizes go to the theorists. Guess what the instrumentalists get? They get the funding. <laughs> <laughs> Instruments are expensive. Now, yes, there is us doing the science. A lot of, of what we do is science, in fact, but it's not the only thing that we have to worry about. Most of you, you have jobs that have a lot more uh, stuff to do than just what your job title says. You don't spend most of your day in your own job, for many of you, what your job title says that you do. And the same thing with astronomers. We don't do astronomy all the time. As I just mentioned, one of the things that we spend an inordinate amount of time on is uh, writing grant proposals and trying to get the money to do the research in the first place. Yes, you, uh, you have to have a lot of money to do a lot of that. Even for theorists, the theorists who do all those computer models, well, you have to have a computer. And with the, uh, the complicated physics involved, yes, it involves a lot of computing power and a lot of money. Now, a lot of other things we do. Astronomers don't just derive an answer and then keep it to themselves. You wouldn't hear about astronomers and the astronomy we do if we didn't uh, publicize our findings. We do a lot of just publications, and that's feedback to us getting the grant, of course, is uh, yes, uh, better in magazines or at conferences. The conferences are the best part, actually. I can tell you about that. Uh, a, a little bit later, it is we spend a lot of our time just trying to put together the communication itself, not doing the science, putting together a, a professional astronomy article, especially in a peer-reviewed uh, journal, takes a lot of time. And it's very painful when you hear all the criticism back from your peers who tell you, <laughs> yeah. Now, rewrite half the article because it's nonsense. <laughs> I'm not saying I had to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, and then the conferences. Some of the time we just present in talks, a little bit different than the talks I'm showing you over here. A lot more technical terms, a uh, lot more graphs, not so many pretty pictures, although in that talk actually there is some kind of nice data over there. But talking about conferences, conferences are great because uh, many of the time you get to travel not on your own money. Okay. Uh, if you have a good grant that allows for conferences, then for me this was one of my best conferences uh, that I went to. Cambridge. 
Recognize the long, very popular tables? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ate at one of those at an astronomy conference. It was an astronomy conference, and, but yeah, that, that was our dinner, and uh, later the banquet and everything. It was great. Uh, my, the very first conference I went to uh, was in Louisville, Kentucky, and I remember at the banquet, this is an astronomy conference. Scientific conference, very serious stuff. I lost five dollars on a course named <laughs> named Hannah's Lot. Uh, our banquet was at Churchill Down. <laughs> Great stuff, ain't it? <laughs> but the food wasn't actually as good. Now, what am I doing right now? I'm just trying. What am I doing right now? Publicizing the struggle. Publicizing, yes. What else? Education. Yes. Correct. Education. We teach. And that's what I think the world scientists should do. But whether they just teach their peers in technical language for people to actually understand it, or for college courses, or the general public. All astronomers, and I'm saying. Uh, and now I'm going back to my original definition of astronomers. Remember, who are astronomers? Everybody. Everybody. This guy was a volunteer at the campus observatory back at Cornell. He wasn't a professional astronomer, but this is what he did. He volunteered in public outreach, teaching what he knew about observing, what he learned from uh, websites and books. He passed on the information. We teach. A lot of our time is also spent on teaching. See how much our time is not just spent on doing the science. We are doing all of this other stuff. And a final perk that uh, especially uh, lots of amateur astronomers are famous for One of the greatest works of, of uh, astronomy is you get to see or discover something nobody in the history of human civilization has ever seen or discovered before. This is a picture of the comet Hillbop, named after two amateur astronomers who discovered it. They, they were professional astronomers, but they were able to put their name in the sky. They saw something nobody else saw before. One of the greatest works of being at the edge of science, even as an amateur. So as I said, everybody is an astronomer. Now, that was just my first presentation. Now, about observing and telescopes, as I said, this is only one aspect of astronomy. People think of telescopes as only one kind of thing. We have lots of interesting misconceptions about when we publicize those pictures about astronomy that, well, that's what the human eye would see. And yeah, it was one of those great telescopes. You look through it, and that's what you will see. I want to dispel some of those myths. Once again, the stereotypical astronomer looks through at the, uh, at the telescope at night has, has a white lab coat on. Why do all scientists have white lab coats? Why are half of them balding and have glasses? <laughs> no offense against people who are balding and have glasses. Stereotypes. So, a couple of questions that are quite common when people are talking about astronomical observations. It's a science, and it's therefore it must be based on observations. First of all, are bigger telescopes better? Well, the short answer is yes, but most people don't know why. Why are bigger telescopes better? More detail. Sorry? More detail. More detail? Okay. Yeah. More light. More light? Mm -hmm. Magnification? Okay. Look deeper into space. Look deeper into space? Okay. Some of those. Those answers are correct, and some of them are not. I can tell you that. 
But I will get back to that in a moment. Why are telescopes built on mountain top? Here or air. Here or air. Keep the glare of the city lights. Glare of the city lights, good, good. Less obstructions. Less obstructions, good, good. Any other? Uh -huh. it's, these are common questions, and it looks like based on some of the answers, so a lot of you have experience over here. But I will get to it, okay? Can you do astronomy only with clear dark skies? Oh, somebody already knows some kind of answer. Want, want to explain? Yeah. Whoever said that no. I said no. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, you do have radio, radio astronomy. Oh, radio astronomy. Somebody already knows about that. Where can you do radio astronomy? You can do it 24 hours. Excellent. Yes, you, there are certain types of astronomy you can do in broad daylight, whether it's overcast or not, although it's usually not recommended you try that in a light in this form because that can actually still interfere. And of course, all of that other stuff. <laughs> I heard that it's coming up the moon landings. They are coming up finding ancient civilizations on Mars. Yes. Um, I have a nice website that will tell you about that. <laughs> so, myths. I, astronomy being perhaps the most public of sciences, because as I said, you have the pretty pictures, is also the one uh, most uh, plagued by misconceptions and myths. Uh, Right now, I'm just going to address some of, the, uh, some of the myths concerning the questions I just showed you about conducting astronomy. That bigger telescopes bring objects closer together, closer to us, or that they magnify better. Uh, no, they don't. The magnification, the telescope, like you give this answer away, actually depends both on the, on the size of the uh, primary. Uh, mirror or lens, but also uh, on the eyepiece itself. When people ask me, what's the uh, magnification in telescope, I tell them, what do you want it to be? I can make it any magnification I want it to, but of course if it's a blurry image, it's just going to magnify the blur as well. So, another misconception is, is that is partly misconception, is that, well, we put telescopes on mountain tops because that way we are closer to space and all those objects. Okay, so we put it uh, about 14,000 feet closer to the object on a planet that's uh, revolving at 900 miles an hour. Uh, so we are also, it's not a constant firm ground in the first place. <laughs> to look for objects that are uh, light years away, which uh, in terms of miles is uh, trillions. So, yes, I'm sure the 14,000 feet will make a lot of difference in terms of closeness. Uh, actually, uh, it has to do just with the atmosphere. We want to uh, remove as much of the atmosphere while still allowing uh, for us to breathe. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, discussions and projects I uh, gave my students, and I know one of you uh, did this before, uh, is to challenge them uh, that, well, if you could build an observatory anywhere, and make any size and whatnot, be creative, what would you do with it? And give it a creative name too. Uh, and, well, one of them said, well, I would build an observatory on the top of Mount Everest. Okay, how? <laughs> um, the engineers are going to freeze to death and won't be able to breathe. Uh, that and Mount Everest is on the border with China, so it will get, and get into some political stuff as well. Uh, and you know, the astronomers and maintenance crew are not going to uh, help with that. So yes, we want it higher up above the weather and much of the atmosphere, but not completely. If you want to get above the atmosphere, just shoot it into space. 
And yes, this question was already answered, so I guess I don't have to repeat myself. Yes, there are certain types of astronomy yeah, that don't use visible light. Much of astronomy is not about visible light. Visible light is actually a very narrow range of information for us. So, and yes, the what you see is what you think you what you see in an image is what you would see with the naked eye. Um, no. First of all, uh, if you look at a weather radar yourself, well, are the clouds green, yellow, and red? No. That's false coloring. A lot of our data has nothing to do with that. And even then, even if we just use certain visible images, even then, our calibration depends on well, what kind of information are we trying to get into? I have some very good uh, examples of that. So, just to show you some examples of the various of us telescopes, just to see uh, if you understand the variety. Classical telescopes, high up on mountain top, near the equator, which helps by the way, you can see the entire sky. Uh, the Keck telescope, some of the biggest telescopes in the world, 10 meter diameter, although no longer round because yeah, that's harder to make. Uh, but yeah, classical telescope. This is what people think a telescope is. This is, an, this also is an astronomical observatory. It's in Puerto Rico, this is the uh, National Radio Observatory near uh, Arecibo. And it's observing 24 hours a day. Through the clouds, the humidity and everything, it's low on the ground, surrounded by a lot of stuff, but it's observing constantly. This too is astronomy. And you're not even restricted to a single telescope. Some of the observations are done with several telescopes simultaneously on like halfway around the world. This is the very long baseline array. Astronomers are known for uh, being very creative with names. Um, it's a series of telescopes that work together to produce a much better image. And of course, we've all heard about perhaps the most famous scientific uh, instrument of all time. When you say Hubble, most people know what you're talking about. You mean this telescope. They have, by now, many of them have forgotten about who Hubble was, but they know the telescope. And yeah, as I said, this isn't a, te a classical telescope. There is a guy at the end, at a late night, that is looking through it. And even, and even the uh, whole collecting uh, apparatus doesn't even have to be a dish, whether it's lens, mirror, uh, or a radio. Some of the types of light, like X-ray, has to be done with very unusual looking mirrors. That's a mirror. And it focuses like that way, not bouncing it back. So there's a lot more uh, to astronomical observations than just the classical lens telescopes. All right. Rain, the habitat outside, and it's right now. If you were to design a, an efficient rain collector, <coughs> how would you design it? Wide, diameter, low angle, and then coming. Uh -huh. Why does the wide diameter matter? You collect more water. Correct. And that's actually the whole idea behind having larger telescopes. Yes, it, for telescopes, size does matter. And the wider it is, the more rain, or in the case of telescopes, the more light you can gather. The bigger the telescope, the fainter objects you can see. Or, to put it in terms of those of you who are into photography, anybody here into photography? Uh, you know about exposure kind of. Can you tell people about why it is so important? <coughs> The longer the exposure time, the more 
light fading on camera register on the other part of the film. Yes. So you can you can use time as a certain way of collecting light. Time also matters. Correct. Thank you. Uh, well, so, but of course, if we can compensate for that by just having a larger collecting area, you can reduce the amount of time you need to expose uh, stuff to. So, so uh, larger telescopes can cut down on the amount of time for you to observe, which is especially important for astronomers considering how backed up the schedules of all those observatories are. Mm -hmm. So you want to be very efficient with time. And especially if you are looking for very faint stuff. And somebody mentioned this earlier. This is the other thing about having a bigger telescope. The bigger the collecting area, the more light you're getting, the more information you're gathering. Uh, the classical example are your two eyes. By having two eyes, you already get, uh, for example, that's perception you get a little bit more information by having two eyes slightly apart. The same thing uh, is uh, the uh, power of having larger telescopes. The larger it is, the more information you are getting, the better details you are getting. This isn't about magnification. As I said, for magnification, um, uh, if it's a blurry image to begin with, well, you are just magnifying the blur. It's not going to help unless you have details. If you have a larger telescope, then it's more worthwhile to do the magnification because then you are magnifying actual details. So that is why larger telescopes uh, help with that. Um, I'm not going to skip over the different types of uh, telescopes because, well, you can look that up yourself actually. Uh, the two major ones that people think about in terms of uh, optical, and by optical I mean visible to the naked eye, telescopes are refractors, lens telescopes, and reflectors, mirror telescopes. And yes, remember the analogy of the ring collector? It brings all of that information together, it collects it at a large area, but brings it together into a focus. Better, whatever the mechanism it is. Now, yes, I mentioned this. My last point I mean, for this part of the presentation is this is uh, and this has been dubbed the pillars of creation, uh, giant molecular cloud. Now, how many of you have seen a star that is magenta in color? I guess. Nobody is looking at the picture right now. OK, all of you have seen it because it was in pictures, but never with the naked eye. That's because these colors are representative colors only. They aren't the true colors that you would see with the naked eye if you were out in space. First of all, if you were out in space, this would be damn faint. You wouldn't see it nearly this clearly. But yeah, you would most definitely not see a magenta or a star. It is because we assign certain colors based on what kind of information do we get. And sometimes we even make mistakes about assigning colors because we misunderstand the information. Most infamously, this comes in with Mars. When the Viking lander uh, arrived on Mars, this was one of the first images it sent back. It has blue sky. So how do I know this is Mars and not the Arizona desert? Yeah. This was actually a miscalibration of the imaging. The actual color that the Martian sky would appear to your naked eye would be a little bit of pinkish orange, not this color. But because the image processing misinterpreted it, it was looking for a blue sky, essentially. That's the bottom line of it. That's why it uh, basically colored in the digital image for us as blue, and that's how uh, we presented it initially. When you see this image, this is a real image of Mars, it's just the colors were assigned wrong. The same thing goes with the conspiracy theorists who say that now that it's coming up that we have found life on Mars, because 
Here is the picture that is publicly available, and that's how NASA is covering it up by making everything publicly available. See that green? That's vegetation. <laughs> that too. This isn't what your eye would see. This is image processing. Image processing you can try out on your own, of course, and I'm going to demonstrate how to use Photoshop. And even in Photoshop, you are aware that you can actually recalibrate the balance of colors, red, blue, and green, uh, depending on what kind of details do you want to bring out. So, and now about the final part, is for those of you who, as I said, have never looked through a telescope, you will ask the question, how would I do any of this? You just said that everybody can be an astronomer, but you spend most of the time talking about professional astronomers and their observations that are very expensive and way really out of my reach. All right? Yes, it takes a little bit of effort to get into astronomy, but, uh, you don't have to go through years of it, and you don't have to spend all of those thousands, well, okay, tens of thousands of dollars of tuition fees uh, to get a degree. You can do astronomy on your own, but you have to start simple. It, uh, one thing how, that amateur astronomers and professional astronomers uh, do share, other than their passion, is patience. So, obviously, if you want to, get to uh, or want to get into astronomy, you know the answer, your personal answer to this question. You like stargazing in the first place, if that's the type of astronomy you are interested in. Um, in which case, start very simple. Systematically, when you step outside, start looking up in the night sky. I remember with my first girlfriend, uh, that's one of the passions that, uh, that we shared uh, is we didn't drive each other crazy by stepping outside into the nice romantic uh, night air and then looked up. Hey, you have a person next to you oh, I, I want that. why are you looking up? That's why I didn't drive for that because she understood, because she also uh, liked astronomy uh, and you were laughing about it. You do that with anybody else and they will tell you, Look at me! Come on! <laughs> <laughs> so yes. So unless you are on a romantic date with somebody, maybe you are just stepping outside, look up and try to see whether you are seeing certain stars, uh, recognize uh, all brighter stars during the uh, summer, the famous uh, uh, Great Summer Triangle. Uh, try to search for that regularly to familiarize yourself with it. Uh, can you identify certain type of constellations? Now, if I just said this for you to try out, this would take for some of you an inordinate amount of time. But it's good practice, as I said, patience, patience. You can, however, accelerate yourself a little bit by getting a little bit of more guidance to know what to look for and where to look. Obviously, you can uh, easily look up. There are internet websites you just type in. Sky chart, July 25. That's how I got uh, this image. It's, that's all I <coughs> typed in. And there were dozens of websites, and I immediately yeah. saw. Now, yes, it takes a little, some practice. Try to figure out what this means versus what I actually see, mm. which is why uh, maybe even that is not the best place to start, but to have, uh, to actually go to the people who constantly observe themselves outside. Hi. Uh, there are many observatories available here in Connecticut as well. Uh, uh, and planetary homes as well, where somebody we usually with a much more powerful laser pointer than this, usually a green in one, uh, can point out things in the star and uh, in the sky and what to look for. They can help you with that. That will be the best practice, is to look for uh, 
scatters like this one, I uh, I downloaded this image from the Bridge for Discovery and Music Museum, where uh, one of their patterns shows is an all ages family show just talking about what's up in the sky. That can give you a very good guidance. So this is available where it's a public observatory where the astronomer, uh, if they are not busy operating the telescope, they'll just step outside with you and start to talk about what the uh, story is about the constellations, what to look for, what are the patterns. Familiarize yourself with that. And it doesn't have to be. Once again, it's not just professionals. Amateur astronomers, remember, we, a lot of what we do is not science. We teach each other. Whatever we know, we love to talk about it. I've been talking to you for 50 minutes, and I lost to stop myself. Uh, yeah, one of the warnings about scientists. Uh, it's not hard to get them to talk. It's getting them to shut up. That's the hard part. In, in professional science, and even in, amongst amateur as, or scientists, there is no such thing as a simple question. If you ask an astronomer some kind of simple question, uh, like, all right, so now what is the definition of a planet? They want to give you well, just the definition. They will talk about the whole controversy for the next 15 minutes, unless you stop them. <laughs> that will happen, I warn you. We love to teach. Astronomers are human beings. We love to talk. We love to teach. <laughs> so. But amateur astro astronomers uh, that tend to gather into all sorts of uh, astronomical societies, astronomy clubs. Uh, astronomy clubs are one of the most popular types of clubs in the entire country. Um, and then you go on their websites to learn about, well, do they have some invited talks? Sometimes they, talk, uh, they give talks to each other. Uh, one of the great talks I went to for an astronomy club told me about small telescopes, what to purchase, how to use them, and even if they were not organized into a talk, they will still have uh, uh, they will still have observing nights that they organize among themselves, bringing their own telescopes, showing off, ooh, my telescope is like this, and I modified it this way, and look at how great the image is. Uh, and they will be able to tell you all of that, and they will be happy to show you all sorts of stuff uh, through their telescopes, as long as you don't arrive with your headlights on. <laughs> they don't like it when you ruin their night vision with your headlights. <laughs> so just search in the area of this one. Is, I just looked up uh, for New Haven. They, uh, this is their calendar, and immediately says, it's a uh, meeting at an observing, sta of observing station. Yeah. So, and a bunch of other interesting things just about what's up in the sky. But they will tell you what are their meetings, uh, what are, the, are their rules, in case uh, you want to actually join them and contribute, or just want to listen to their talks. This is a great resource. Amateur astronomers are also astronomers. Everybody is an astronomer. And start simple. You don't even need a telescope. An amazing amount of information can be gathered just from using binoculars, which I brought mine as well, but apparently we might not be able to use it. Um, she's, she's checking right now. Um, that these uh, binoculars are actually much better optics than Galileo Galilei has when he first uh, made all those great discoveries. These binoculars. Galilei, oh, Galilei's first telescopes had such awful optics. Uh, you can get that kind of uh, resolution and uh, uh, image using theater goggles. <laughs> These are actually much better. And immediately, you start to look at the moon, you can already see the edge effects, the critters. You can see in the Milky Way there are lots of stars you have not seen before, and you will start to see some of the brighter nebula. You will, uh, in case uh, you are not 
uh, in the middle of a really dark dark skies, uh, you will actually need this to see the Andromeda galaxy. You will see something that's two million light years away with a binocular. So, oh, and later on, binoculars are actually still useful uh, because most telescopes you look at come with a finder. What is that finder for? Getting you into the general neighborhood. Getting you into the general neighborhood. But do you know that neighborhood? For those who begin, and even those who are already experts at the night sky and finding objects that are invisible to our eyes. Right. Remember, telescopes also bring about objects that you wouldn't see with the naked eye, but that how can point at them by knowing the neighborhood. And this is one of the best tools to explore that neighborhood in the first place so that you can find your way around and then you can point your telescope correctly at what you want it to look at. And of course, as I said, patience. If you actually get your own telescope or you can use somebody else's, it takes lots of practice. It won't happen overnight, which is one of the reasons why we start what I actually asked for tonight to be a first quarter moon night because that's one of the best things to start on is to look at something that's very obvious and relatively easy to find the moon big bright you can point your telescope off at it no problem before you go into the harder stuff and that way you get a lot of practice and skill pointing your telescope that way, you will first of all won't break the telescope the first night, mm -hmm. and second of all, you won't get too frustrated not finding anything, and then just sell the telescope on eBay because you get frustrated <laughs> with it. So start simple is what I said, and patience. Now, for those of you who want to go beyond just looking, actually, let me hide it a little bit. Um, on the next slide, I will talk about literature and internet. For those of you who want a lot of information, and this is a true story. And apparently, I'm not the only one who met this story. Uh, on my uh, bi-weekly conversation on the phone with my mother, she uh, said, all right, my son, how is it going? Uh, is it true that scientists are plan about to plan asteroids on Mars? Uh, yeah. So I asked her, well, where did she hear that? Um, so she sent me the article on CNN. Um, and I read it. So uh, I didn't immediately dismiss it as nonsense. Instead, what I meant is, all right, the article says, who was the group responsible for or, or, or uh, the so-called asparagus on Mars? Who are the astronomers? What did their original website say? Here's what their website said. The Phoenix Center on Mars has found that the Martian soil there is uh, alkaline. 